Hi guys, Mike Noel here, Blockchain Weekly. Um, I'm hoping everyone can uh, can hear me and everything is going well with everyone out there in blockchain land. Uh, today we have uh, a very special guest with us today talking about uh, things in healthcare. Um, interesting background that Heather has. It's going to be an interesting conversation. A lot of things happening in, in healthcare uh, we've talked about some of them, um, you know, in uh, IoT and being able to interface IoT devices with uh, uh, with the blockchain. Um, first of all, let's uh, let's dive a little bit into the first segment. First ten or fifteen minutes, we try and talk about all things blockchain. What's happened in the last week, and it has been an interesting week, actually. Um, uh, Moody's. This is on CNBC, and and you know, it seems like when we first started this, you know, back last year. Um, you really had to dive deep for some of the new articles and, and to look at some of the things that were happening. Not the case so much uh, nowadays. Uh, you know, CNBC is, is publishing things on blockchain almost every day, it seems like. Uh, this on, uh, on uh, CNBC last week, or this week, uh, blockchain to disrupt the swift hold on the global banking system. Blockchain has the potential to significantly reduce transaction cost and time. Hmm. That's a, uh, that's, who knew? Uh, likely cutting into bank fees and commissions, Moody said in a report on Monday. Uh, in that scenario, Switzerland is most at risk since its massive banking industry generates half of its revenue from fees and commission. Uh, the ratings agency said Switzerland also is among the nation's most sensitive to blockchain technologies potential, excuse me, potential to drastically increase the uh, efficiency of cross-border payments. That's why we're here, right? Uh, we're looking to uh, uh, disrupt it, and it looks like CNBC and some of the other uh, groups are are finally beginning to realize what it is we're all about and what it is we're doing. This is going to be an interesting chain of events, let me tell you. Uh, oh, Mastercard! Th this on Coin Telegraph, one of our uh, one of our stable um, uh, sources for news here on Blockchain Weekly. Mastercard payments block chain tech to combat combat fake identities. So MasterCard actually has, uh, has a, a patent for the proof of identity uh, for cardholders. Uh, they're going to be keeping data on the blockchain. I think this is a great uh, system. Um, why they have patented, I can see why they have patented. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I'm not sure where, where they're going to be able to protect that patent. We've already done a lot of stuff in that space, a lot of variables, things of this nature. But it's nice to know that MasterCard is finally moving in and, and uh and doing some uh, uh, some connections and doing some some things with uh, uh, with blockchain. Um, also, um, Brookings.edu, uh, the blockchain is no longer a tool to, to mine cryptocurrencies or manage database. Now, U.S. states governments have recognized the technology's potential for the delivery of public services. We're moving into a different realm here. Uh, we we have had a lot of different companies, a lot of different opportunities in blockchain where we've looked at rationalizing uh, distributed ledger technology and decentralization in uh, corporations and companies, small companies, um, uh, for the most part at this point, but moving into larger organizations. And now the uh, U.S. and state governments are also moving into looking at how they can cut costs and increase efficient efficiencies uh, and services across the board. Um, one of our uh, legislators, and I can't remember which one it was, I was having an interesting conversation with him, and one of his questions was, why can't we have the, uh, the motor vehicle division on a blockchain, and, and what, would that, what would that do? And I basically said, there's no reason why we can't. Uh, and it seems to me that it would reduce the cost drastically and make things a lot, a lot easier for people. Lots of different opportunities as far as this blockchain thing. And uh, uh, federal governments and state governments are beginning to, uh, to uh, recognize blockchain's uh, appeal. Uh, here in Phoenix, Arizona, a signature on a blockchain is legal and binding, just like it is anywhere else. So uh, it, it's interesting to note that um, uh, there's, there's communities and, and corporations that are embracing blockchain at a faster and faster rate and are identifying areas where uh, or it can actually be used and, and, and involved. We weren't having the same conversation, you know, last year, that's for sure. Uh, we're definitely moving forward. 
Um, this on Market Watch: Can blockchain technology live up to the hype? Um, Barclay says no. So Mastercard, all the governments um, say yes, and Barclay says no. Um, uh, so uh, Barclays goes in and looks at blockchain and its potential, and it's and and I think that they're looking at things like the energy draining of a proof of work and 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 this kind of stuff, and they're looking at the current infrastructure, and they're trying to go to to down it and say that this is not going to work long term. Um, when we all know that uh, you know things definitely are are going to get better, they're going to get more efficient. We've got uh, lots of different proof mechanisms coming up. And I think Barclays is in a position where they might they, they might suffer a little bit if blockchain comes down. I mean, a lot of the types of transactions that they do um, are, are, ba- are, are, are transactions that we can do a lot easier, a lot quicker. In fact, we can do them a thousand times quicker and a hundred times less expensive on, on blockchain. Um, inside the Jordan refugee camp that runs on blockchain, we have a, 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 a refugee camp that is doing proof of stake and proof of identity um uh, and started building the block uh, chain for the jordan uh, refugee camp in 2017 keeping that data uh, structured on the blockchain um it, it's no longer cloistered in, in small areas where people can't find it or can't or can't use it it's on a blockchain and, and people that that uh, need it and people that are uh, handing out food people that are providing security people that are providing connections to people outside of the refugee camp and to families and things of this nature are taking advantage of the database that exists on the blockchain because they can and they couldn't before um uh, lots of things going on um i i read this and and i think this is going to be backwards let me check this oh it it is not backwards so there's a, a magazine now called Distributed. Um, I think this is a, uh, a great source of information. Uh, you can sign up for it at distributed.com forward slash ledger. Uh, it's published once every other, uh, twice a year. Uh, this is the second uh, issue of Distributed that I have had. Um, it's a great, great, great viewpoint of distributed ledger technology and some of the things are taking place on the global marketplace, not just in the United States. I think that sometimes uh, in the United States and the audience here probably is the majority of the United States, uh, more majority in the U S but I think a lot of times we're not, we're not being exposed to a lot of um, a lot of the things that are happening in blockchain on a global basis, Um, investments and things of this nature and uh, reg, you know, know your customer, um, Sometimes companies are a little hesitant to come in and, and, and uh, pr- promote their uh, their products when they're raising money inside the uh, uh, the borders of the United States for, for several different reasons. Um, but this is an interesting article from Dubai. Uh, Dubai builds the blockchain city. Uh, the government body charged with registering and organizing real estate in the United Arab Emirates' largest city, the Dubai Land Development Group, DLD, is determined to become the world's first government entity to process and implement all transactions on the blockchain. All transactions on the blockchain. The DLD hopes to have all of Dubai's uh, properties recorded on the blockchain within three years. DLD has created the blockchain system using a smart and secure database. It records all real estate transactions, including lease registrations, and then links them with the Dubai Electric and Water Authority, the telecommunications system, and various other property-related bills. Uh, blockchain secure electronic real estate platform incorporates personal tenant databases, including uh, Emirates identity cards and the validity of residential residential visas, and allows tenants to make payments electronically without the need to write checks or print any papers. We've been talking about this for a while, and it's coming here. And when do you think it's going to come? Maybe five years, six years, ten years down the road. The first step in the and the loftier goal is that Dubai has to record the process and all the government documents and transactions on the blockchain by 2020. So uh, a couple of years away. Things are happening quickly in this thing we're calling distributed ledger. Things are happening very, very swiftly. Um, and um, 2019 is going to be the year that a lot of industries begin to really understand what uh, distributed ledger is, what the potential is when someone in their stack begins to conduct transactions a thousand times quicker and a hundred times less expensive and they begin to uh, uh, rise above uh, them on the stack this is this is going to be taking taking place here really quickly 
Um, everything has been compressed uh, with the, the technology post the internet, post IoT, about eight years, uh, the internet of data, about five years, the internet of value, blockchain, or uh, 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 Bitcoin, about about two years, and now we're into the internet of trust, and it's, it's, it's already here and already going to be passed before we know it. So uh, that's uh, what's happened this week. Lots of things happening um, in this industry. Um, I want to just take a, a couple of, of moments here and thank Mike and uh, thank Shindig for this wonderful platform that they provide. Uh, you guys are in the audience. I can see there, there's actually a, a group that has joined together. There's two people um, in, the, in the audience and they're, they have a little sidebar going and they're having some discussions. Uh, they can they can they can join and, and, and chat and introduce one another while we're here up on stage. Uh, please feel free to do that. It looks like we have um, a massive number of questions, Heather. So, um, uh, oh yes, oh yes. Um, uh, this is going to be interesting. So, um, uh, this is going to be interesting. This is going to be an interesting one. We got uh, a bunch of questions for you, Heather, right off the bat. So um, uh, let's uh, bring up Heather Flannery without ado. Um, and Heather, you're attached to Smitty. So let's see if this is going to work. I'm going to throw you up on the spotlight in the pod. I'm going to put them. Uh, there you go. Heather, are you there? You are there. I am. Yes. Uh, are you able to hear me now? It's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure, um, and uh, and we're honored to uh, to have you on the show today. Lots of things that, that you've done, um, going over your um, uh, your profession and what you're doing in blockchain and healthcare. Uh, healthcare, we're we're always interested. We've talked a lot about uh, healthcare and blockchain uh, and some of the potentials uh, for blockchain technology and IoT and things of this nature and saving lives. Uh, and it's just interesting to have you today. Um, where we'll begin to talk about some of the things that are actually happening. Um, I want to understand a little bit about who you are first, you know, how, how, you know, what's your background? What, you know, there's, there's a bunch of strange guys that are involved in blockchain and, and, um, you know, <laughs> we're, we're mostly geeks. Um, you don't appear yeah. to be a geek. <laughs> if, if that's the case, it's totally an illusion. I'm absolutely a geek through and through. Yes. Yeah, hundred percent. Let's let's throw down on sci-fi. Let's go through the the history all of, right. of all of the social and technical evolution of of the internet forward. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's it's really exciting to be here. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur and a technologist, and uh, and I've been focused exclusively on healthcare since about 2005. And uh, so I've been I've been looking at uh, healthcare problems from a large scale, complex adaptive systems sort of philosophy, and I landed on on working on non communicable disease prevention and treatment models and innovations in those spaces, both in care delivery and business model paradigms as well as technical paradigms. Uh, through my through my going concern obesity PPM and for the last couple of years I've been highly focused on how to take advantage of distributed ledger technologies as early as possible even as the tools development has been early and there's a lot of there's a many many challenges and and it's gotten me um, I've prioritized my engagement throughout the healthcare industry in order to help advance the barriers uh, to adoption of this technology because like you I'm, I'm incredibly excited about its potential. So great to be here today. I'm looking forward to this conversation as well. Well, we're we're definitely honored, and and it's uh, good to know that you're a fellow geek, and I and I feel much more, more much more comfortable about the about the conversation today. Um, so um, uh, you mentioned obes obesity PPM. You mentioned some some of your background. Let's let's talk about obesity PPM and and, and what are you doing there? What is, what is that doing? I, I know there's other things we want to talk about, but let's focus a little bit on, on obesity PPM and what the goal is, and uh, maybe some of the some of the things you're thinking about doing or are doing with distributed ledger technology. Yeah, absolutely. That's an excellent place to start because it it was working to solve my challenges within obesity PPM that led me into the blockchain space and the crypto space and so on. So uh, I founded obesity PPM in, in 2009 
and I've been taking it through its evolution since that point. And the goal of that organization is to deliver disease management, population health, and research administration services to health systems in the Americas. That really involves uh, care coordination, extensive challenges with data management and interoperability, uh, needing to move through, really thread the needle on many sticky challenges from a compliance perspective and a regulatory perspective. Uh, and, and it also involves moving, moving patients effectively, not within the identity of single organizations, but across organizational boundaries and solving, uh, solving the problems from the patient's perspective while also delivering aggregate improvements in population health and, and other measures that are important to all healthcare stakeholders. So you can kind of see if, don't you agree, how that really sets the stage <laughs> for an ideal set of challenges that could be mitigated through the use of distributed ledger technology but I conceived of it long before, uh, long before there was any viability of these things. So I'll stop. Does that make sense so far? Uh, th th it makes absolute sense. I, except, uh, I don't think I would call it a field that you're working in. I think you. I, I think I might call it a minefield that you're trying to negotiate. Oh. I mean, lo lots, lots of different things going on here as far as regulatory, uh, uh, healthcare compliance, uh, HIPAA yes. compliance. Um, and and I, I I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say this. Um, but these compliances are killing people every day. That's interesting. If you think about the Hippocratic Oath and first do no harm, and examine what is the risk to the patient if there's a privacy breach, versus what is the risk to the patient if their providers aren't able to access their medical information, especially in emergent situations. Uh, we have we have organized healthcare delivery to prioritize for compliance, uh, and I don't know that the patients actually really agree that that's their highest priority. So as we look as we look to implementing a truly patient centered health system and stripping out waste, fraud, and abuse, radically enhancing the patient experience, delivering price transparency, all of the kinds of things that that can be moved uh, using these technologies. It's important to recognize we've got to refuel the plane in flight. If you've ever seen the, that picture of you know a, a gigantic aircraft with F-16s refueling at thirty thousand feet or more, sure. that's what we, that's what we're trying to do as we examine tackling these things um, in a situation where patients right now are in life and death situations. Healthcare can't stop and pause and step back. Uh, in order to think about these things. So it's really challenging to drive organizational change when all the stakeholders involved have conflicting interests. Uh, the, the, the legal and regulatory framework is very uh, finely tuned and limiting in its, in its structures. So those, those are some of the challenges in its early iterations that obesity PPM needed to solve. And, and it did solve them, though, in ways that I, as a technologist, I would call inelegant. Uh, yes, and if that, if that makes sense. So, so we are able to accomplish certain goals absent the use of distributed ledger technology. But uh, does that mean that there's not extraordinarily high levels of value ready to be manifested? Uh, with the use of this technology, it absolutely does. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I've worked on this a little bit with a couple of companies, and I, and I think I've, I've kind of identified at least one of the the, the, the problems and one of the issues is is that we have uh, we have a, a database that exists at the primary care physician's office, right? It has information in it about what the what the patient has undergone and history. Um, it is sitting in a server someplace in that office, or uh, not even data, data, not even digitized at this point, but sitting in file folders, <laughs> right? It's un, it's yeah. inaccessible, right? It's inaccessible. Um, we have uh, a, a myriad of information that is available to us from the payor or the insurance company. The insurance company has data and has a data set about what's what's happened to this patient, and they have uh, they have incredible detailed information on the CPT codes that have been uh, implemented and what the procedures are and what has happened, what the history of this, this patient is. Um, mm -hmm. No one can get to it. We have uh, information that, uh, that exists 
in a hospital that where the patient presented, uh, you know, a year and a half ago um, and had an issue and was treated in an emergency environment. That information sits in, 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 a, in a hospital someplace in another state. There's a um, uh, incidents where the patient is in state and has had presented themselves at various emergency rooms um, around the state. And there, there's a data that has to do there with the, that keeps track of, of what this patient has gone through and what the history is. It, it, and now you have an EMT physician and I'm, 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 I, I'm not as familiar with, with the obesity PPM, please forgive me. Um, but I am familiar with the, some of the things that, uh, are, are going on with another company in the epilepsy uh, industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the emergency uh, medical technician is presented with someone having a seizure. It could be a chemical seizure. It could be a brain seizure. It could, I mean, there's 10, 15 different things that could be happening here. <clears throat> the, the EMT looks at the patient and understands that this is what's happening. There are 15 things that possibly could be and makes a guess. Um, because he doesn't have a, a basic access to the history. Uh, if he were to have one of these things in his hand, and nine times out of ten they do, and, you know, lends a, uh, you know, a, a something that was on the patient's risk and understand, oh, okay, well, I understand the history now, I understand what's going on, and I understand this this, this person's having an epileptic seizure. This person's having a, a seizure that is involved with peanuts or, or food uh, origins, or this person has had a brain injury. And there's there's different procedures that uh, uh, that the EMT has to go through. Um, and sometimes they make the, 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 the wrong guess, uh, and sometimes the patient doesn't survive. Um, and we have all this data that is set in cloistered in databases that are protected. Uh, you know, they're, they're sitting in Diebold safes and they're protected by Wackenhut guards <laughs> all over the place, right? Um, and because we can't get to that data and lens that data at the appropriate time when, when the patient, um, uh, if the patient, we were asked the patient, look, uh, you have your, your choice here. Um, you can choose. Uh, to keep your patient data secret from these people that are trying to help you, or um, you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, you can let them help you and let them help you. There's one way you're going to live. There's one way you might not live, which, which is your choice. Um, I, I, it, it gets down to that point, right? It absolutely does. And, and health data has some unique characteristics in, in the sense of if let's ex have a thought experiment and imagine that, health data is a commodity, like oil that needs, like crude oil that needs to be taken out of the earth in order to be used. That, that value is, is relative to the individual who owns it, but when it is pooled and aggregated, particularly if you had provenance and high integrity data, there is a force multiplying, potentially massive benefit to society as a whole when you're able to, for example, point in an artificial intelligence at processing large scale health data to make discoveries uh, that that would not even occur to a human mind. So right. so you have you have extremely important value to the individual who owns it, and then you have untold opportunity available to society at large through aggregation and liquidity and clarity and integrity and provenance of this data. Well as it stands right now, exactly as you described, I love that word you used, cloistered. It, it's, it's, it's very appropriate. It, our health, we, we have potentially dozens or even hundreds of copies of our health data that according to the law, technically we own. It's completely uh, not meaningful in any way because in the current state, uh, an individual health consumer can't aggregate or share or manage access to its own to their own health data in the current state, regardless of what the law may say in the United States. Citizens of Estonia, by contrast, in fact, can do that now as the nation of Estonia has driven the earliest adoption of of electronic health records and patient self sovereignty with respect to management of that data. But if, if we can use this technology to create liquidity where they are siloed, to create transparency where everything is obfuscated, to create auditability uh, where, where the, the alignment of the interest needs to be brought together, uh, we have the potential to take health data, which is, which is a, a high value, though not quantified value commodity, 
and, and make it accessible at scale to the benefit of the individual and society. And, and that's, that's the revolutionary paradigm, among other things, in the health sector uh, that, that uh, distributed ledger technologies can enable. Yeah, um, so that's the overarching um, uh, metadata that, that exists and, and using AI in that kind of stuff and bringing that to bear and, and improving the, the process overall. That, and that's, uh, that, that's an overarching issue that, that exists. That's true, very true. Um, just so many things that we have that, um, you know, it just, I mean, it's how are we going to do this and how are we moving forward and, and how can we accelerate the process? Um, uh, and how can we, uh, help the legislators understand how important this is as, uh, democracies like Estonia, um, uh, eclipse the technology that, uh, the United States, this democracy has. We're becoming a third world country um, and we're being left behind and left in the lurch, this technological lurch uh, as other countries begin to embrace it. Other countries like Estonia, other countries like Malta. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, my hat's off to legislators because we have had uh, you know, some great stuff that has passed recently as far as blockchain and, and allowing us to do things on blockchain, but still no, it, it's mean? a... <laughs> we love you wyoming yeah 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 um but it kind of pales in comparison to what you're talking about as far as estonia in in actually p taking personal liberty to the next step and allowing personal liberty of, of a person's identity and their data right yes and and it it uh it spans so a couple comments to that point one um you, you mentioned health outcomes in the developing world by comparison to the developed world. And you've got a number of different statuses of health economies around the world. Uh, the United States aggregate population health outcomes are unfortunately rather poor. And that is mainly in the form of disparities. So, so it's because if you, if you take an arithmetical mean of a very excellent outcome and a very terrible outcome, you end up you know, not so great. Uh, so, so we have a we have a really massive difference in the way that healthcare is delivered and access and utilization of evidence based treatment across different socioeconomic and geographic and other other psychographic health economic characterizations. Char characterizations. I think this technology is something that can can um, greatly democratize access to care. And, and that getting to the value of that health data at a population at a population level is, is part of that. Um, and, and the other piece with respect to the concerns of US citizens specifically, um, right now, a, 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 a tremendous amount of clinical research, uh, if, you're, if you're developing a new drug or diagnostic or therapeutic or what have you, most of those companies that have to do those stage three clinical trials they conduct them everywhere else in the world, even if they're American companies, they conduct them everywhere but the United States. So, so if, if you have a rare disease or a fatal illness and you want to make the choice of your own volition to engage in an experiment as, a, as an investigational subject, as an American citizen, unless you travel to other nations around the world, you don't generally get that opportunity. And, and so we can't just think about this as within the context of mainstream medicine. We also have to think of it in, in the context of clinical research and translational medicine and, and what it means that all these problems prevent um, sovereignty, free will, choice of, of the patient to, to take risks with their own health. And often the, the risks that they're taking, they're hoping it might, might save their lives. It, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I, I think we probably shouldn't touch on this and, and we should move on to different, uh, different scenarios because we're, we're, we're explaining the, the fact that um, the healthcare system in America is the most expensive system globally and it is the least effective and has the least efficient returns. Um, and it's a sad thing. It's very true. Imagine what we could do if we had if if we started to introduce aspects of radical transparency in into price and in now you're talking dirty. <laughs> radical, yes, yeah, they're they're dangerous ideas. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm, 
I am a, par- a, a you know a patriot, um, and I believe in this democracy. Um, but I also see some things that are happening that uh, uh, it's a shame they're happening. I, I want to get to some questions. Uh, it's it's a little early in the system uh, to to uh, uh, to go here, but I, um, there's a couple of interesting questions. There's there's a couple that are not really relevant. I want to get to you, Don Carly. Um, uh, Schmitty, I want to talk to you a little bit about what it is that we're doing and and uh, uh, some of the disruptive technologies. But I want to kind of focus a little bit on healthcare, and I want to go to um, one of our regular viewers, Mr. John Crockett. Uh, John Crockett has been involved in the healthcare industry as a uh, as a CEO and a CEI uh, IO, um, and and has probably some really good information. I'm going to publish one of his. Um, one of his questions here, and let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, so, how does she, being you, see Mirth and their dominance in the HIE space working for or against the initiatives you're talking about? So, I'm not familiar enough with Mirth to speak intelligently to that question, um, though. Though I do have. Uh, a lot of work in progress regarding the interoperability of health data and the challenges around it and the fact that blockchain is absolutely not a panacea. Uh, It does not intrinsically resolve that problem. Um, So talking about interop and some of the solutions that that may be in place, uh, I'd love to do that, particularly the, the importance of standards and also the limitation of standards and how the use of, of semantic services layers and AI and uh, even some automated code generation and things like that might be able to bridge the gap hypothetically in the future. Okay. Um, uh, and I believe Mirth is a healthcare information exchange uh, that they're trying to do. Um, uh, a lot of people attacking this, and, and good question, John. I hope that answers your question. Um, I, I want to go a little bit to uh, Don Carley. Uh, Don Carley has asked a couple of questions. Uh, one of them happens to deal with um, uh, in, information in legal medical cannabis. Uh, we're probably going to have to answer at least one or two of these questions. So let's let's publish this and talk a little bit about MMJ and uh, its viability in the system. Um, And I'm particularly interested in statistics, trends, and issues uh, related to blockchain applications in the legal medical cannabis market in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, So let's let's talk a little bit about that. What are your thoughts as far as MMJ? Do you have any? Well, I think that... that... Ooh, just got a feedback feedback from there. Not sure what changed from an audio perspective. Uh, I haven't changed anything on my side, Uh, but okay. So I think that the the issues of any new set of interventions really come down to research and research translation and being able to have larger series size, longer duration, multi-site studies, and then viable ways of developing guidelines and measuring the translation of those guidelines into practice. Um, distributed ledger technologies, when used for research administration purposes and for and for uh, tracking of the degree to which evidence-based medicine is being practiced once an evidence base is developed, uh, it definitely sits at the intersection of being able to solve those problems for for the utilization of any new kind of compound or old kind of compound or molecule that we may be describing. Uh, in terms of in terms of legal innovation, um, I I am absolutely continuously. I, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm, I refer to myself as a legal enthusiast, and I find I find myself endlessly fascinated at the intersections of the law and the adoption or in, innovation theory and the and the, the the achievement of innovation. So, I mean, I'm, I have um, I have colleagues of mine who are attorneys who focus uh, who focus in this space, including one law firm that has a sub practice in in the jurisdictions where there's various degrees of legalization of cannabis. Um, I think I think that uh, the development of new legal instruments and the jurisdictional clarification about where and how smart contracts relate to uh, actual contract instruments, how the parties of identi- you know the parties are identified, you know to your points you made at the opening Mike about the various identity issues, which is a huge topic in its own right. 
Uh, so I, I think it all, I, I think it's a, a, a brilliant case in point where you've got, um, you've got evolving bodies of law, legal innovations and technological innovations, along with medical or therapeutic or interventional change all happening at once. I, and, and sometimes I think that the change that is happening and the innovation that is happening is outstripping the understanding of the legislators. Did I say that politely? That was very diplomatic. But you know what? I want to tell you a quick. I want to tell you a quick story, though. And, and I, I have to say, so I live in Washington D.C. So it, it makes it easy for me to, to, to engage with, with those processes just because of my proximity. So I attended a, an open congressional briefing uh, not too long ago, and I'll be candid with you. I walked in grumpy already, ready to be frustrated, ready to be disappointed. This kind of body language. I sat there. You know, staring holes at them. I, I mean, I, I, I could not have gone into that um, subcommittee meeting with more skepticism and concern about regulation destroying our industry as it's being birthed. And I have to say, in, in defense of our, this was a Senate subcommittee on technology innovation, looking at at cryptocurrencies and and non crypto use cases of blockchain technology. I came away sincerely humbled. I felt I felt that I had been unfair in my negative judgment. I was impressed by the thoughtfulness and the keen focus on balancing the interests of security and privacy um, and, and, and the, the, the work of criminal actors versus business and technical innovators. So I actually was inspired and I'm also a patriot. Good, 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 good. Um, I'm, I, I've had a, a similar experience and a, and a completely different experience. I mean, there's been several different um, uh, legislative panels that have been uh, called on blockchain technology. Some of them were, uh, the, the beginnings were extremely rudimentary and, um, uh, and uninteresting, but there have been some interesting stuff that I've seen here recently that kind of gives me hope. Um, and so I, I definitely share that, uh, uh, that feeling with you. So we've talked a little bit nothing, about nothing. Nothing could be as as bad though as what we all had to witness with the our the attempted understanding at Facebook's business model recently. That that's not in our space, but that's definitely an example from the other side that was pretty comedic. Yeah, it was <laughs> comedic. Ooh, talk about outstripping the understanding of the legislatures that are trying to control it. Um, uh, and there's a lot of that going on. I mean. Um, I, I just think that the that the the flinch sometime is to um, is to legislate regulatory um, uh, laws and, and and infect them and try and, and I mean the Winklebuy had had done some things in New York and you're probably familiar with some of the some of the tremendous failures of legislation that have come out of some of that activity. Um, it comes down to the point that it's a decentralized mentality that we have to have when we're talking about distributive ledger technology and, and blockchain. You have to understand that this is distribute that this is decentralized, and a decentralized uh, technology doesn't really care what its centralized counterpart thinks. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's true. <laughs> and it's true, and. It for example, though, I think that the, for example, the Securities and Exchange Commission has has gone on record recognizing the value that they would experience were they to be a monitoring node on on a on a, a trading environment or a network that that removes a tremendous amount of burden that they endure trying to continuously investigate potential bad actors, and they've gone on record acknowledging those points of value. Um, yeah. And they've, yeah, they've the, taken a pretty, you know, benign neglect kind of approach so far, which which many are thankful for, you know. Yeah, yeah, but they're beginning to claw back. They're beginning to, uh, you know. But then there's other things like Polynex Circle and Polynex in the exchange, and they're they've actually sat down with the SEC. We have a a group here locally called Sweetbridge, and the CEO uh, of Sweetbridge has actually sat down with the SEC. Uh, I've had several guests that have talked with the SEC. Um, I haven't got a call to, to sit down and chat with them, and I probably don't have the budget for a lawyer, so I don't, I'm not going to wish that on me. But I think that it's it's going to take 
people like you and people like that that uh, uh, you know actually sit down and discuss things in an open forum and in an open environment and let them know you know this is this is what we're trying to do. We're not bad actors, um, and that if we're not doing it, someone else is going to. So I, I, I think we've kind of taken a little turn there. We've talked a little bit about the overarching issues and um, we have, uh, um, uh, we've, we've threatened um, uh, more than one legislative body in the United States. And I think we should probably maybe, <laughs> maybe calm these things down. And let's go back to um, uh, healthcare. Uh, John has a, uh, another uh, interesting question that I'm gonna publish here. Uh, and the EHR space is crowded, extremely competitive, ridiculously proprietary. How does she, you see uh, that reality, that reality affecting wide adoption of the blockchain-based health data? Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, Mister. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean. Yeah, John, yeah. And I would just so just to add to the a layer of complexity before answering the question. We also have to recognize that that's true of the EHR vendors, but the EHR vendors once implemented in a health system, they don't own that data anymore. Now that data belongs according to their contracts to the health systems and according to the law to the patients. So the layers of complexity uh, continue to mount. Uh, so, so the EHR vendors in data that's operational actually have no control over what happens to that data. They, they can control their software ostensibly uh, if we could get them to want to. Uh, but so, so there's a couple things that need to be mentioned in terms of regulatory forcing functions that we hope are going to drive change. And, and our Department of Health and Hu Human Services uh, Office of the National Coordinator for Health, Health IT has been delivering what I think is, is very competent and grounded leadership to, to drive this change. And our, our, reg our, uh, our legislature has, has contributed. So from a regulatory perspective, we have meaningful use stage three. Which, which involves the, the data compliance with uh, specific standards, particularly FHIR, F-H-I-R, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. And then we have the 20th century, uh, the 21st Century Cures Act uh, that, that is coming into effect that creates a, a stronger enforcement angle for patient-centered care and, and the large part of the defense on, on what is going to create the forcing functions that support patient self-sovereignty of, of their health data. So when you look at um, personal health records, that there are there are many. Um, actually, I, I run a webinar series. We featured two different personal health record vendors that are that are completely blockchain-based in HealthWiz and AmChart. Uh, both are excellent, they have different strategies, but both are excellent players in the space. And, and uh, there's also patient Tory. Uh, that's uh, the CEO of Patient Tory is a co-author on a, an article just published. So these new these new technologies and the the token economies that they bring to bear and the infrastructures that they bring to bear, combined with meaningful use stage three and the 21st Century Cures Act, and eventually demand from the patients themselves, which is going to take the longest. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll gradually get to the point that we can use distributed ledger technologies to create liquidity of data. That won't necessarily solve interoperability of data, but liquidity is a great step. <laughs> um, so I, does that answer the question? I, I think it does, but it, I, mean, there, I mean, there's still a big disconnect for me because I understand it that, uh, I, you know, it, so there's EHR, right? And they collect data. Uh, and that is their data uh, contractually. Legally, it belongs to the patient. Is that correct? Right. Well, the case law varies by state. Broadly right. interpreted, a patient owns their health data, but right, right. Uh, the okay. systems are owned by the providers, and the right. providers also own it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the providers own it, they also own it, and it's data that is owned really by the uh, by the patient, right? And we're going to take and we're going to start using distributed ledger technology. Let's look at that. Are you going to use a utility token? Even if you're using a t utility token, it could be a uh, it could be construed as a security token. And we got FINRA, we got the SEC. I mean, you follow me on this? I do. When I when I, when I say land when I say landmine. <laughs> yeah. I like that. You're, you're not working in a field. You're working in a minefield. That was that was a that was a great quote. Uh, so 
so the 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 token economies that have been envisioned to date and 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 there are many that are presently in development that have already been through rounds of fundraising and they're coding furiously right now uh these uh, these token economies vary but they generally are they generally were classed or regulated as a security and they used exemptions from secu the securities and exchange act in order to fundraise but there's a problem there's a number of problems that we're going to have to solve in an industry as an industry with that one is that those those tokens or coins whichever you want to call them depending on what ventures strategy we're describing uh, they are and they are they are not stable they are volatile and that volatility largely is driven by speculative activity, uh, and uh, and that's a that's a really a, a challenge. If you take if you think just the U.S. economy, healthcare is roughly twenty percent of GDP. Roughly, it's going up, unfortunately, as a proportion. Let's imagine that you were to to try to use. We were talking about price transparency, payments, approvals, and authorizations, and you were try you would try to participate. Uh, in those kinds of transactions with highly volatile tokens, uh, it simply wouldn't work economically at all. Uh, and if you uh, and if you moved those payments out of the U.S. dollar into cryptos, you'd tank the dollar. Yeah. So so yeah. That, so if you, if you wanted to do pay, health revolution at scale, you would need to have a pairing of a stable commodity system for the data itself. And a stable, a stable coin of some form, likely pegged to the dollar, if not a crypto U.S. dollar someday, uh, that that does not experience the kind of market fluctuations or volatility that would be needed to go at scale in an industry this say? large. What did you just say? I just want to. Did you say a crypto U.S. dollar? Well, sovereign cryptos are very interesting ideas, but uh, that are certainly not my ideas, uh, but okay. I'm simply reflecting on the likelihood that many of our fiat currencies that we're accustomed to today may in fact be cryptocurrencies in the future, though backed by a nation state potentially. There you go. There you go. Yeah, and it, and it is true. When, when, if, if the GDP at 20% at 20 of the GDP uh, being in healthcare, um, and as we age, it's becoming an even larger portion of the GDP. Uh, the, keeping control of that and keeping it inside the system it becomes more and more important and more and more um, uh, relevant to uh, the general population and, and their care. That said, we have other third world countries that are doing it much better than we are um, and, and providing uh, improved healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare levels that are above what we're experiencing here in the United States at a lower rate. So, we, I we mean, have it, to acknowledge that our our system of government was not designed or optimized with efficiencies in mind. It just wasn't. Our our federal republic is intended to, you know, uh, prevent rapid or uncontrolled change. And there's two sides, is positive and negative. And in, in the case of healthcare, we're we're that is hurting us. But the alternative could be the tyranny of the masses. So, so I, I think the the cautious approach here. It's frustrating. We want things to be faster, but there's no way over or around. We just have to go through these processes. You you said um, uh, you said. Uh... Uh, U.S. Uh, a U.S. cryptocurrency and the tyranny of the masses within a, a within the same space of, of I, I I don't know I have a whole new respect for you I'm not worthy to be here uh, that uh, that is that is something that is absolutely incredible uh, and uh, I just love to hear these kinds of conversations uh, we are getting towards the top of the hour uh, I have many 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 questions uh, Don Carley has been very patient I want to I, I want to try this I want to spotlight him I want to get him up on stage. We're going to talk to you here in a, in a second, Don, and and have you ask your question. Uh, let's see if we can get this done uh, in a new pod. So, Don, are you there? Are you live? Don, can you hear me? I hear you. Very good. Hello. Hello. So I was uh, very interested to hear your comment about stablecoin and 
um, I'm curious if you have any aware, any awareness of some of the stable coins that have been introduced att attempting to address this very issue of the volatility uh, that cryptocurrencies uh, deal with. Uh, some of them are Tether, MakerDAO, Basecoin, and a more recent one called Koala, um, which also do not have, in the case of Koala, doesn't have the proof of work burden of energy consumption in its mining architecture, which is another interesting constraint. So that was the one question. The other was had to do with these, uh, some of the approaches to uh, self-sovereignty using uh, blockchain technology like Nugget, which allows one to control one's identity and the, dis the, the, uh, uh, the distribution or, or sharing of uh, your information only through a token rather than through the information itself. So those are my two questions. Any familiarity with either of these categories of stable coins or uh, identity tokens? Yes, I, I am familiar with several of the, uh, the stable coins that you mentioned and, and true USD is another interesting one. Um, I've been looking at these, if, if we look at it from a roadmap perspective, uh, we're, we're going to be able to achieve a tremendous amount of value without having to really deal with token economies in the health sector, meaning there is so much low hanging fruit that is so valuable that you don't even have to get into token economies to get benefit. So I think about 2018, 2019 as the years of consortia blockchains, not necessarily token dependent technologies looking at things like that. But if we're looking at this strategically, and long run, there's no question that the next level of, of extraordinary benefit will come by applying the elegant uh, behavioral economic and game theory that can be manifested in this space. And that means the, the trading of, you, you know, the using of a token economy. In health specifically, my vision, and this is, I don't know if anyone is uh, other than me has been thinking about this, but, but I see a pairing of, of a security and a commodity both with stabilizing elements and that they need that, that, that you can't use the same token that is the thing to pay for the thing at scale. Right. You can't buy apples with apples or buy pork belly with pork belly. So, mm -hmm. so we need the framework to define, uh, to define health data as a body of commodities. That's an, that would be a burgeoning field of law to drive that. Mm -hmm. And we also need to adopt one or more stable coins uh, I don't believe there will be one. So we need inter a cross-chain interop. Uh, and that's that's a long-range vision and strategy we need to be working toward now with the understanding that it's it's going to manifest more like three to five years out. And it, it, that's my gut feel. I'm not a futurist, but... That's interesting. I, I, what, mm -hmm. what I think it's important, at least from my perspective, to distinguish between blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies or tokens because the, the yeah. two are not equivalent. Um, the right. problem, my original question had to do with medical cannabis or and, and the, the legal cannabis market in general, goes to a more fundamental issue, which is they're unbankable as a general rule. So the, what I'm interested in is the degree to which cannabis as a medical alternative to opioids, for example, um, may be constrained in its deployment due to the unbankable aspects of the cannabis supply chain. So if blockchain and or cryptocurrencies could provide a way for legal transactions to be carried out and banked, <laughs> we might then see adoption of those alternatives supplanting opioids as one example. Um, it's really the, it, it had more to do with the, that has more to do with cryptocurrency than with blockchain specifically. Mm -hmm. The blockchain after, application, I think, comes into the, the management of identity or or actually the valorization of personal information. Um, in effect, that personal information, when aggregated, could provide a basis for clinical analysis. But today, it you, one doesn't have self-sovereignty and one doesn't have the ability to trade in that information without handing it over to an intermediary that you can't necessarily trust. <laughs> at, at True. All. So, so the... Uh, the compartmentalization of identity as a means of maintaining civil libertarian priorities. Uh, Self-sovereignty uh, is generally the, the term that's being used to describe it. 
Well, not even. I, I'm actually referring to I, self sovereignty being presumed as a value. I am talking mm -hmm. about compartmentalization of identities that can't be cross sectionally connected mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. as a, a key priority for for freedom and liberty, liberty, and a also a a key priority for for law enforcement in dealing with criminal actors. Uh, these, mm -hmm. you know, these are these are parallel structures, and the sure. and then, you know. They are neither the bad genie, nor good. The genie may be, well be out of the bottle beyond recapture. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. And Don, I, I do agree with you on that. It is getting a, a little bit uh, towards the top of the hour here. We've got a couple of housekeeping items we want to do. Anyway, thank I, you I, for the no, you, you bet. You bet. One I had. Thank you. Thanks. What a pleasure. Thank you. Um, um, and, uh, I, you know, it's, it's getting to the top of the hour. This hour is the fastest hour of my week always. Um, and this week has been no exception. But, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, with your uh, uh, the FDA trime trials and some of the stuff that you're doing, I mean, uh, let's uh, if medic if cannabis is a schedule one and there are no medical benefits, but there are medical benefits. Uh, the, I mean, that's the root of the problem. And if we can fix that one, then we probably the rest of it would be much more easier to fix. Um, and why not do an F a quasi FDA trial on the blockchain and make it public? Um, uh, you know, there's several people about that. There's, yes. Yeah. There's, there's several companies, Bud Bo is a, is a client, uh, is a, is a person that we've, we've had on that's doing that budbo.io and, uh, they're looking at doing a, a tracking and there's uh, several different companies and maybe you have one that, that you're, that you're familiar with. Well, I would like to very briefly mention that I'm part of a standards development activity run by the IEEE regarding clinical trial data management and that there are parties from the FDA that are also engaged in those same processes. So, so uh, um, absolutely critical work in progress. It's exciting. Yeah, ab absolutely critical work. And, and blockchain is, uh, uh, is at the heart of it. Um, and and I, I mean, John, I, I apologize. I think he's got like six or seven different questions here. Don's got six or seven different questions. We have, uh, we have two other people that have questions. This has been a, uh, been an awesome topic. It certainly has uh, uh, has spurred a lot of interesting conversation and a, a lot of interesting thought. Uh, we did not get it all taken care of in this hour, and and uh, uh, the audience and the people that we didn't get to. I, I all I can do is apologize, and uh, uh, maybe maybe Heather, we can have you back on. We we just scratched the surface, and it's been an hour. Isn't that amazing? It, it has. It's incredible how fast it goes. And this has been a lot of fun. I'd be thrilled to come back. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do that. Um, uh, housekeeping here, Mike, Mike Alakis, I want to thank you for uh, providing this great uh, uh, shindig platform. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. Um, I, I hope that you had uh, an opportunity to at least think a little bit, a little bit differently about blockchain and uh, the technology that's coming to the healthcare market and think differently uh, about some of the choices that you're going to be making when you talk to others um, because the people here and the people that are listening to this are, are going to be become the experts in the future and and, and think carefully about uh, the, the the choices that you make when you have conversations with other people about healthcare. Uh, this is in my estimation one of the most important uh, projects that uh, is happening currently on blockchain. Um, it, it's definitely going to save lives, uh, and it's definitely something that is well, well overdue um, to to um, uh, to actually be rationalized in the workflow. I thank you. Uh, I, 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 and if you want to, um, let's give a, a obesity PPM. Uh, give us the website. Give us a contact information that you'd like to. To, to give, um, let's let's get that going right now. So go ahead. Well, um, uh, Obesity PPM, my, my company is available at obesityppm.com. Uh, reaching me through LinkedIn is probably the, the easiest way, Heather Flannery. Um, I also run a blockchain and healthcare webinar series and, and maybe uh, maybe you might have uh, guests that, that would be interested in participating in that. And you can you can also find that through my, uh, through my LinkedIn activities and uh, if this was a great honor and a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And there you go. You've wasted another perfectly good hour on a Wednesday afternoon talking about blockchain and all things blockchain. And and, and uh, we hope that we provided you with a glimpse of the future. I'm Mike Noel. I'm the host here at Blockchain Weekly. I'm also the CEO and co-founder for 
uh, blockchain consultants, blockchain consultants at blockchainconsultants.io. And we help rationalize workflows doing uh, using distributed ledger technology and decentralized ideas and uh, decentralized thought processes. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate you, Heather. Thanks again. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks.